Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, very happy to see you all. I hope you could all connect well as well. Um, I am Sigrun Habermann, the head of the library services at the UN Geneva Library and Archives. And we'll be speaking today about promoting understanding in a world of information. To improve our understanding, I think the first slide is going to go onto the accessibility features. Voila, so you see pictures of our team, of some of our team members here as well. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that, voila, you can have closed captioning there. What I would like to, um, to mention is that for the Q&A afterwards, you could just also raise your hand or put something on the chat, a question in the chat. But you can actually do this all the time during the event as well. We have a whole team who's going to be checking and we'll be proceeding like that. So let's get started. Promoting understanding in a world of information. So that's the title of today's discussion. And I do have to admit that it is a large topic, right? So let me just explain how we came about with this subject and how we will approach it today. So the Liga, Liga, sorry, the Library and Archives of the United Nations has a motto but it was given by Florence Wilson, who was the head librarian of the League of Nations. That's why I was speaking about that. So uh, she gave this library, which used to be the League of Nations Library and then transferred to the United Nations here in Geneva, the motto of being a center for research and an instrument of international understanding. Florence Wilson was really a smart person and particularly she was a visionary. She already translated that action uh, the same way that we're doing it today, actually. Bringing people together is what we do now, to share knowledge. We talk about knowledge as well. We help to create new knowledge as well. So you might tell me, well, nothing new. Libraries have been doing this for a long time, right? If you think about the Salon de Lecture, in the, I think it was in the 17th, 18th century already. So. What I think though is special, or what we think is special about this knowledge sharing at the United Nations is that it always comes with a particular purpose. It comes with the purpose of creating understanding for peace, to support people living peacefully together. So that motto that was given to us as an institution, uh, it's quite inspiring for most of us. It also gives us a duty, it's like a mandate, to consistently review and consider what people need so that we can actually achieve that. So we created this space now, and you're actually in its virtual area today. It has become the knowledge and learning commons so that we can keep evolving with the needs of library and archives users. And those users are United Nations staff and diplomats, but they're also the academic community. And so you can see the commons actually keeps us in direct contact with them as well. And in the latest learning assessments, because this is what we do through the commons as well, we found out that our users want more guidance on how to navigate this, what we termed the world of information or this wealth of information. And we all know what we're speaking about here, right? Particularly online or digitally. So they want guidance on finding, analyzing and using information. And in short, they want us to help them be information literate to better understand what's going on around them. So this is how I come to a full circle again with this introduction actually. Libraries and information and communication professionals, we can promote understanding by promoting information literacy. It's actually a quite basic concept. So the discussion today is actually a launch event for a whole series. It sets the scene for the series of products on information literacy or for information literacy. And for this launch event, we chose three different areas that concern information literacy today. We're going to start with something very practical related to libraries, so with library literacy training. And then we're going to focus on media information resources, their creation and their use. And then we top it off, kind of la série sur le gâteau, with the academic angle. And that's going to be research concerning information use today and the need for information literacy. And of course, in all these three aspects, what we want to get out of that at the very end is try to find out particularly what is the role of the information and the communication professional in all that. 
and quite possibly we will also find some best practices or some lessons learned for ourselves and maybe also for our users, the information seekers. Voila! So we start off this discussion with a really outstanding example of information literacy training. And that is happening at the library of the University of Geneva. And this is how I'm going to introduce Gervaise Ballet. Hello, Gervaise. Yes, hello. hello. Everything's going well? Yes. Yes, hello. So, uh, Gervais is a librarian who specialized at the university library in documentary information, but also in adult learning. And she works directly in information literacy. So as a little clin d'oeil, as the, the French say, I saw online that you also worked in the public library in the Discothèque Vieux-Sur. <laughs> and there you manage the music collections and the reference services. <laughs> it sounds like a really fun job to anyone who loves music. So I just wanted to mention that. And I'm sure you know now how to be in touch with your users as well, right? So going back to our topic, Gervais, I'm now giving you the floor to explain to us how the information literacy program works at the University Library of Geneva. Okay, thank you, uh, Sigrun. Uh, so here's a brief uh, overview of our experience with information literacy tra training at the University of uh, Geneva Library. Uh, let's start with the objectives of uh, our information skills training courses. So we aim at uh, preparing our students to become independent in their academic work and later in their professional work also. Because these information skills and more largely uh, the transversal skills uh, they will have acquired at university will be useful to them throughout their professional and uh, personal lives. Uh, information literacy and more specifically scientific information is important for students starting university because for most of them this is the first time that they will use scientific literature and because they are learning how scientific knowledge is constructed and how the scientific publication process plays a part in it. So for them having these skills will be an asset um, to succeed in their studies and uh, future careers. Uh, we can switch on the slides. Yes, the third one, yes, now. Yes. So to set up our bachelor's and master level courses, we rely on this uh, framework for information literacy skills. Um, he's available in French only because uh, this is a framework uh, that we made here at the, the university. So this document details the key competencies that every student uh, should acquire during the academic pathway. Uh, not, all, not all the skills uh, in that framework can be covered in every course. Uh, that's why we work closely with teaching uh, staff to offer tailor-made training sessions that are integrated into academic courses and meet their specific needs. These partnerships between librarian and the teaching staff are essential to uh, the de de development of uh, our offering. So our training courses are designed to be as interactive as possible. We prefer the workshop format with practical exercises in a small group, but uh, it's not always possible. For example, our workshop, um, in our workshop, students can learn to find reliable sources um, of scientific information in their field, or uh, they can assess the quality of this information, or they learn to analyze and keep uh, abreast of recent scientific search, or about controversies or best evidence um, on their subject. We also show them how to use bibliographic software to be more effective in the management of this information. And we make them aware of copyright compliance and avoid the risk of uh, plagiarism. Um, on the next slide, you can see some a few figures. So in 2022, we delivered uh, 414 training sessions. 141 of which were integrated in the bachelor programs 
and 28 into the master's programs. And uh, we had a total of 4,500 participants uh, that, has, uh, that have benefited from this training session integrated in their uh, bachelor or master. Uh, the most popular topics requested to the library for bachelor and master's courses are how to conduct, how to conduct relevant information search strategies uh, using the most appropriate methods or tools, and also how to apply citation rules for their um, work, um, academic work. Uh, however, training sessions are adapted to the needs of each program and can include very specific topics like, for example, how to search for safety information about drugs uh, and medication or how to evaluate the quality of a web page, for example. Um, Yes, the challenge is now. So our workshop are now well integrated into many programs, but we still face different challenges. The first one is uh, that we have to negotiate with the teacher the provision of a few hours of their uh, own lessons to be present in all programs and ensure that these hours are continued beyond teachers' changes or uh, programs' evolution. The second one uh, is that we need to build sessions for large classes, sometimes for more than 450 students, uh, while trying to privilege workshops or at least an application of these skills in an academic work in a fairly tight schedule. Um, so soon after our training. And uh, the last one is uh, the arrival of the artificial intelligence. Um, uh, some teachers ask us to make an introduction on the benefits and dangers of uh, AI or uh, AI. And uh, some of our, of our colleagues are beginning to do so, but most of our team uh, still has to be trained. Um, and uh, that's all. In conclusion, we can say that um, we are proud to play a role in the development of uh, our students as uh, independent researchers and, and learners. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gervais. Uh, Thank that's you. a very concrete example and a very successful one. Almost 4,000 students in one year. That's amazing. I assume that you have a, quite a big team for that? Uh, the team, uh, I don't know exactly, <laughs> uh, maybe I ask for law, it's about uh, 20 persons for that. 20 persons. And at the university we have um, 17, 17,000, uh, around 17,000 uh, students. Mm -hmm. So all the students are not um, cannot benefit uh, of our uh, training for for the moment. Of course, yeah. And as you were saying, this is quite a big challenge. Uh, I was also thinking uh, about those the partnerships with the teaching staff. Um, this is really important to have this these partnerships, and I think uh, that is one of the obstacles for libraries in general. The challenge is you know, to be more in contact with, let's say, an organizing entity to be then uh, able to, to really have a program that's integrated into a regular workflow or a curriculum as it is for years there. So uh, I was just wondering how these, this partnership came about. Did the teaching staff request for the library to be included or how did it happen? Uh, yes, may I speak in French now? Yes, of course. <laughs> and I remind everyone there's closed caption. You can just click on, on the English then. Oui, bien sûr. Oui, oui, OK. Euh, donc, il y a les deux cas de figure. Donc, euh, les enseignants font effectivement appel à nous euh, quand ils en ont besoin. Mais on essaie aussi pour les programmes où on n'intervient pas encore d'être proactif. Et puis d'abord de faire appel à nos contacts euh, réguliers avec les enseignants pour leur proposer d'intervenir dans leur dans leur cours et puis pour ceux avec pour les programmes avec lesquels on n'a pas forcément de contact 
là, on, on a vraiment besoin d'être proactif et puis on, 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 on essaie d'analyser en fait euh, leur programme de cours. On essaie de repérer les moments où euh, ça aurait le plus de sens d'intervenir, c'est-à-dire les moments où les étudiants ont de la recherche de littérature à, à effectuer ou, ou au moment où ils doivent rendre des travaux, euh, typiquement par exemple leur travail de bachelor ou leur travail de, de master, et puis de proposer à ce moment-là euh, d'intervenir. Et de repérer aussi des cours euh, qui seraient plutôt transversaux pour euh, des volets plus larges, parce que ben, avec 20 personnes, on ne peut pas euh, intervenir dans chaque cours à option euh, euh, qui serait éventuellement euh, proposé dans un programme. Mmh. Donc là, ça demande d'aller de, auprès des, des enseignants. Là, on essaye aussi de repérer justement les, les bureaux qui, qui organisent les programmes ou les, les comités d'enseignants qui, euh, qui sont responsables des programmes et de contacter ces personnes-là ou directement les enseignants qui donnent les cours. Mmh. Très bien. Moi, ça semble, comme je disais, beaucoup de travail de, de planification et aussi de outreach. Donc moi, je vais... Oui. Je peux poser la question donc, du coup en France, franglais, je pense. <rire> donc, euh, autre chose, est-ce que vous avez euh, du feedback Le feedback que vous recevez, de, donc les, les euh, retours que vous recevez des, des étudiants et des enseignants aussi. Est-ce qu'il y a, euh, j'imagine, comme c'est un succès euh, et ça se répand, ça veut dire que ça doit être positif en général, mais est-ce qu'il y a une différence dans, dans les retours que vous, que vous recevez des étudiants et des enseignants alors, euh, je ne dirais pas qu'il y a vraiment une différence entre ces retours. Euh, ben, en général, effectivement, ils sont positifs. Euh, la, la, meilleure, euh, la meilleure réponse, c'est quand les enseignants font appel à nous chaque année pour réintervenir euh, dans, dans leurs cours. Euh, on, pour, pour certains cours, on, le, notre cours est, il y a une ou deux questions qui est intégrée dans les, dans les questionnaires d'évaluation que les étudiants reçoivent en principe euh, après chaque euh, module de cours. Mm -hmm. Donc ça, on essaie aussi d'être intégré là-dedans, mais ce n'est pas le cas pour, euh, pour, toutes les, pour tous les cours. Et puis, euh, peut-être... Euh, on, on a, dans, dans, enfin, ce qui revenait le plus souvent euh, quand on était évalué justement dans ces programmes d'évaluation, c'est euh, le, euh, le point peut-être négatif, c'est que parfois on intervient soit trop tôt, soit trop tard. Et là, les étudiants nous, nous disent que ah, bah, j'aurais bien voulu apprendre ça avant, au moment où j'avais tel, tel travail à faire ou euh, où ça n'arrive pas au bon moment parce que c'est un mois qui est hyper chargé pour nous. Voilà, c'est plutôt le, le moment où on intervient qui, qui leur plaît ou qui leur déplaît. Mmh. Ah oui, j'imagine que vous apprenez de tout ce que vous, tout ce qu'on vous donne comme retour. Ouais. Oui, oui, oui. Après, on, on ajuste avec l'enseignant souvent. Mmh. Euh, on avance le cours ou on le, le retarde. Très ouais. bien. C'est agile. On essaye, oui. <rire> voilà, c'est important aujourd'hui, hein. même si ce n'est pas la méthodologie agile, mais quand même, agilité, c'est vraiment un, un mot-clé maintenant. Voilà, merci beaucoup Gervaise. Euh, merci à vous, Stéphane. Je reviens plus tard avec euh, d'autres questions, évidemment. Et merci. Now I'm going to switch back into English to keep, uh, keep this, this conversation in English. And we're now going to, um, I'm now going to introduce Daniel Johnson. So... We're looking at this angle, as I said before, which is more of the, the media information resources. Daniel is a UN reporter, United Nations reporter. He's working for the UN Information Service in Geneva, and he's currently the officer in charge of the radio, TV, and the webcast section of this service as well. But he's actually specializing in radio news production so far, so he has a really great voice. And I'm going <laughs> to hand over to you right now, Daniel. Um, <laughs> Could you please tell us a bit more about yourself and the service that you work for? Yeah, thank you very much, Sigrun. Hello, everybody. Nice it's uh, a so real pleasure to be it's here. Nice. Can you hear me, first of all? There we go. Now it's good. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes, yeah. it's fine. Great, coming through. Great. It, uh, super to talk to you. And um, thank you very much for the invitation and Javez for uh, kicking us off on this information highway that we're on, um, barreling forward uh, 100 miles an hour. Um, so to answer your question, Sigrun, so I work for UN 
TV radio webcast. And uh, I've been here since 2014 when I first started uh, out working for what was then UN Radio. Now, radio no longer really exists in, in the form that it did then, even this is what, nine years ago. Now it's multimedia, it's sort of morphed into multimedia. And it's done that because we, the aim is to really maximize the impact of each uh, piece of content and each media that we produce. So if I produce an audio interview with somebody fascinating from um, from Timbuktu, um, then I can hopefully these days now uh, record that video uh, of the exchange and then repurpose that or a little excerpt of it for social media so that we are hitting, um, well, killing two birds with one stone, if you like, um, which uh, reminds me that my son was very upset when I told him about this phrase. So why, why would you be killing two birds with one stone, Daddy? Anyway, uh, that, that's an aside. Um, I'm sorry, just one second. I'm sorry, I'm just giving you a talk. Library. Beg your pardon. Um, I should have locked the door. But in fact, there isn't a lock in it, so I can't. Uh, so um, That's the, point is, news. Uh, the, the, the point is that uh, I'm producing uh, news across uh, print for UN News in New York, radio for, for um, UN News and our broadcast partners, and uh, multimedia, as I say, and we produce in Geneva. We're very lucky to have a TV studio, which is something I don't think many other uh, UN information services have at all. Um, we have a, a TV studio so we can produce TV edits of the very latest news that's happening. Um, I should say that um, we don't aim to be exclusive. We try to include information that will appeal to everybody from uh, from f everybody in the street, everybody who, who we should be talking to, uh, from bus drivers to broadcasters. Okay, that's the sort of uh, broad brush approach that we use. UN News is available in nine languages. So there are the six official UN languages in addition, in addition to three more in New York, um, which are produced by language teams there, Kiswahili, um, Hindu, for example, and Portuguese. So. Um, Multilingual content is obviously a massive priority for us, for all language teams. I think I've wrapped it on long enough. Uh, I'll let you ask me another question, Sigrun. You were talking a lot about the, the audiences, right? So that is very interesting, obviously. You have a really wide range, and also that means a wide range of, of understanding that you are addressing your information to, right? So can you let me know how you reach out to these audiences? What do you do to get your message across? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning, we, we're, we're across all sorts of different media. So we're reaching those who are looking for printed content, for written content, those who are looking for audio because they're in a car or they're washing up and they just want to listen to something while they're doing it. Those who follow social media, um, but not all of social media. You know, we, we just can't. Where do you, where do you draw the line? Uh, we're already across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. So that's four. And that takes you know, it takes a lot of work. So um, we can we can approach those different um, target audiences, uh, Twitter, of course. Um, but then you ask me, how do we talk to them? And exactly. um, we do that via news pieces. We do it via interviews to get first person testimony, which is often the most powerful, of course. Um, we're trying to cater to as many different target audiences as possible. But Communicating with them isn't, of course, the same as reaching them, you know, properly reaching people, grabbing them, giving them a shake, trying to get them engaged with what we're doing. And what we well, one of one of the things that really pushes me on is the fact that um, a every story they tell us is different. Everybody has a different uh, story to tell. And B, the way that we tell it is really important. And the way we sh I believe we should tell news and, and break down difficult concepts like the Sustainable Development Goals is by um, giving a little bit of data, but remembering that, as the, the wonderful psychologist Dr. Pauline Bart used to say, everything is data, but data isn't everything, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is to say that the human story is what really matters, all right? We don't want to drown people with figures. Yes, they're important. But as long as we know that we have the, the statistics to back up what's being said, remember, everything isn't data, okay? So it, it's, it's, it's really about the human story. 
and Dr. Pauline Butt. You can look her up. She unfortunately left us a couple of years ago. But that is something that really guides me and it guides a lot of the language teams because uh, often we are dealing with humanitarian crises, mm -hmm. climate shocks, um, emergencies, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit uh, uh, later. Um, you also asked about messaging and how do we get our messages across? So, so whether it's an appeal for funding for a humanitarian emergency or the Secretary General who's uh, going to be warning us, uh, warning about climate change, um, we're, we're able to use, and what we're doing more and more is, is live blogs, okay? So live blogs which increasingly resemble uh, what's happening on Twitter and other social media platforms to give, to give information to people, not in real time, but in as close to real time as possible, because that's what people actually want. And that's kind of reassuring that they're looking for this. They have this thirst for information. Um, and we're going to be featuring live blogging in the high level segment at COP28 on the 1st and 2nd of December. OK, if you, in case you're interested, that'll be on uh, UN News. Um, I should say, and you will uh, tell me to be quiet, Sigrun, when, when you've heard enough, but um, at UN Geneva, we're very lucky to have uh, a lot of uh, visiting stars mm -hmm. and VIPs, call them what you will. Um, earlier this summer, we had Joan Byers, who gave us a, a wonderful um, phrase. She said, action is the best antidote to despair in relation to climate change, in relation to being um, uh, an activist and in uh, relation to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. So, you know, they make our job very easy. Um, and I have no reason to question what she's going to say because she has a, a legacy of, of activism and, and militancy. So, you know, those are the kinds of easy wins, low hanging fruit, if you like, that we have. Excuse me a second. Unless, um, unless you have a question, I'll, cr I'll crack on with another part, which is um, one of our other visitors, Maria Reza. Um, Maria Reza, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, who came to visit uh, the, she was giving a uh, press conference in B128, which is the room I think you're probably in now, yes. uh, Sigrun, earlier this summer for the Internet yeah. Governance Forum. And she gave us a ton of really interesting, uh, engaging material uh, and quotes uh, and telling us that, uh, you know, why do we need reliable information? What is, what is the point of reliable information? Well, of course we need it because without it, we lose the very democratic foundations that uphold the rules-based order that we stand for and that we aspire to. Um, she told us that if our information ecosystem does not change and if lies spread faster than facts, which is the case at the moment, sadly, if we continue to elect illiberal leaders democratically, we will fall off the edge of the cliff. Um, so she said that really at the moment, this is a critical point. This is a, a point where we could fall off a cliff um, unless we really um, uh, engage. She wanted everybody to engage in, in being the, the truth tellers in, in terms of um, getting out there and not just accepting what you see online all the time. So mm -hmm. those are some of the, uh, the ways that we try to reach, uh, communicate and engage with our various audiences, which is a global audience. That sounds, sounds really interesting. And even I, you know, I've, I've been at the UN now for almost 30 years. But uh, it's still fascinating to me to see how you work and how actually also media has, has evolved. How do, you, how do you catch up with these trends? And especially right now, I mean, there's so many platforms now you could be on. There are, there are so many ways of, of, uh, of going out there. I'm a, I know there are some guidelines from the UN, right? What is it based on then? How can we, as, as your information uh, users, because you, you're producing this information for me, right? How, how do I know that this is, uh, you know, this is the official statement? This mm. is something that, that I can stand to as yeah. well? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, of course, that's fundamental. Um, we are, of course, human. We want to, we want to give the latest information. We want it to be quick. We want it to be instantaneous, and we want it to have the, the biggest impact, the maximum impact. But we have to be very careful. I mean, 99% of the time, okay, the information that we receive is from UN agencies. All right, so we're we're not we're not trying to um, break the mold. We're we're trying to um, reiterate. We're trying to promote messaging from the UN that's been approved, checked and distributed to, to UN News, okay? So we are not trying to, to catch anybody out. There's no reason why I should 
um, disbelieve something that's been provided from a UN agency, uh, particularly in the field, which is where most of this information comes from, or from reports, um, whether it's the World Health Organization, whether it's a survey on, on COVID or on Ebola, you know, they, they, these are scientific studies um, and um, we, we can trust those. All right. But when it gets to, so that's the 99% of the time. Um, when it comes to things like uh, the Middle East crisis, you know, Gaza, Israel, now that is, is extremely difficult. And you can multiply by about a thousand the difficulty of actually checking facts in the field. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples, if I may. Please. So a week last Friday, um, during a press conference or just before a, a press briefing with um, UN agencies here in Geneva, there were reports that um, a fuel deal had been agreed um, between Israel and Egypt uh, to let fuel into Gaza, which obviously would have huge huge ramifications, positive ramifications for everybody in the enclave. Because without fuel, as you know, you can't run desalination plants, you can't run bakeries, you can't run generators, even for communications, um, uh, uh, telecoms um, infrastructure. So it's very difficult to, inf to actually verify anything within, within the enclave at the moment because there's so little fuel around. So we were desperate to know about this fuel. That's why fuel was such a big deal for us. And so we wanted to write about it in the top line of the story, you know, saying um, the UN's welcomed this, uh, this fuel deal, uh, which is going to lead to uh, hundreds of trucks reaching um, the most vulnerable people in need, which of course we care passionate, care passionately about. Um, but we couldn't get confirmation of that. Um, because as I said, it was a bit of a vicious circle, there was no fuel to power the, the comms masts in uh, Gaza. And the agencies that are operational there just weren't responding. So we just had to hold off on that one. And, and it's very frustrating, you know, um, but that's, that's the right call. That mm -hmm. is the right call. And so what, what we didn't do was put out some wrong information. Okay. We didn't have to take down the story. We didn't have to issue a, um, a retraction. We didn't get demarched by um, any permanent representatives. Um, which is not a pleasant experience. I'm not talking from personal experience. That's just vicariously. And so I wouldn't really, really want to be there uh, face to face uh, being dressed down. But, you know, it, it's this it's really UN key. Role. Yes. I'm sorry. This is this is our UN role as well. Right. We're intermediaries as well. Yeah, yeah we are. We are. But we we want to keep people with us. Um, I mean, it might not seem so significant, but at the time it was really important. I mean, it's still important about the, the fuel issue. Yeah. So that's that's one sort of news um, element that you have to take into account. But there's another, and just to give you a final example on the Gaza crisis, one um, thing that we're seeing more and more in the news is that people want to understand how aid operations work. You know, what is the what are the nuts and bolts? Um, what how does a UN agency actually get aid into a place like Gaza? And we know there's a Rafa border crossing. Um, but many people didn't understand that there's also a Rafa city inside um, Gaza. And so fuel, when you say fuel is getting to Rafa, is it going from there to, into the city or not? So you've got to be very clear about what is what, where is, where things are based, where infrastructure is based. And you've also got to be careful about what um, UN chiefs are saying, agency chiefs are saying, or very senior officials are saying, because uh, it's you know, it's not Hollywood, it's not scripted. Often they can be asked questions in a press conference. Uh, what's, you know, what's the latest that you're hearing? And the latest they're hearing might not be accurate. It might not be the very latest. For example, if they've been stewing in a TV studio for the last half an hour waiting for a live link, uh, they might not have the latest information. And what they might not also have is the sensitivities of the needs on the ground of the agencies working with the governments uh, who are trying to um, get aid into a place like Gaza, for example. So you might have a, a, an agency principal saying something that then you, that you report on faithfully because you're trying to, because what they say, it doesn't really go much higher than them. You've got the secretary general, but you know, these are, these are the big cheeses of the organization. What they say usually goes, but sometimes they're not on message. So you've got us, and then you might get into trouble for that because it's not appreciated that, you know, you've, you've, 
written verbatim what they've said because they they they're not you know they haven't done it because they're being malicious it's just because the things are so delicate now everybody's looking at you and and it's really really high pressure and very intense so you've got to be very careful um, and so one particular example uh, in, in one case it meant that an article had to come down be rewritten go through a various series of checks within the UN and then go to the agents well within new UN news I should say and then go to the other agency that was upset about this um, and then their response was sure we'll get back to you within the week within the week I mean we're producing news every day this isn't good enough and it's been a week and we haven't heard from them so you can see that you know these are the imperatives that that um, make or break a story um, they but also nonetheless make us, these are the constraints it, you work with if I if I listen to that it also slows down actually you in reporting or reporting in general if you want to verify your sources right if you really want to go that way that you're not going to report what is not absolutely ascertained right so uh, how do you how can you then can you then still compete with the uh, other sources that are out there or, or how do you try right. to manage yeah that? I mean it, it's the same with that fuel going back to the fuel issue because we couldn't report on the fuel access we could nonetheless get different streams of information from other humanitarian sources world health organization um un relief works agency for palestinian refugees yeah there's there are, you know, with a crisis like Gaza, it's so massive, there, there's usually something, but those sources are coming um, from daily updates. So these agencies are working extremely hard. Uh, you just have to know where to look for it. That's the thing. Um, you know, Relief Web is, is a good place to start. Their own um, social media accounts. We have internal comms. Um, lines of lines of communication with spokespersons uh, so so you might see something online then you'll go to the internal comms uh, line to verify that that's that's accurate they might say I've no idea I'm checking they might tell you something else that you didn't know about mm -hmm. off the record you know it's it's a it's a constant flow of information I mean um, you can be sure that there's a we're like we're like ducks on on the water paddling furiously underneath trying to get um, a line that, mm -hmm. that can then be followed by all the language units. Okay, that, that's very interesting and enlightening also about the different type of sources that you use. You already mentioned a couple of those. Um, then I just wanted to quickly also go into this verified campaign that the UN, uh, the, the Department of Global Communication has started a while ago already. And some of our, use, our listeners here or viewers you know, might actually be familiar with that. Would you be able to explain a little bit what it's all about? I tell you, I can be super brief on that because it's um, it it sort of falls into this is a campaign that was launched by Melissa Fleming, who's the Under Secretary General for Communications for um, the the whole of the communications of the United Nations um, Global Communications. So this was one of her initiatives, and it's a big one launched during COVID, and the aim was to save lives because there was so much disinformation, misinformation uh, flying around. Um, and there was one example that I remember because we reported on it um, uh, from Mexico, I believe. Uh, I don't think I'm mistaken, where they said, stay in your homes because the UN will deliver aid to you, which was wrong. You know, of course, pe you know, people were going hungry uh, and starving because they were expecting the UN to come and find them. That's what they saw on their on their social media. And it was total fabrication. Um, you know, and just nasty, nasty. So uh, Melissa Fleming uh, got got behind this campaign called Verified, and and the aim was to have information volunteers. So you or I could be, <laughs> excuse me, information volunteers, and uh, you would build up a rapport and a following, and your your post um, would would have a verified sticker on it, and that would be shared um, with other uh, verified sources. Uh, who you trusted, and then so on and so forth, until you had this this network of of trusted information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so so that was the aim of that. And I should say, and it's still going on, but I should say that this falls into what Maria Racer was saying about everybody should get involved. You know, to be a responsible global citizen, you should be involved in creating your own 
bubble of, of information which you can share with people you know. Don't be afraid of doing that. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say about this was, um, it reminds me of when the Secretary General last month was warning about the, the benefits and pitfalls of artificial intelligence, you know, AI generated data, because he was launching a new uh, initiative on this. Um, I'm just looking for a bit more detail on it. And he was he was saying that um, he was saying how surprised he was to see online there was an example of him speaking fluent Cantonese with his lips in sync, even though the SG does not speak Chinese. I and mean, he speaks many languages, but uh, Cantonese is not one of them. Uh, you know, and he was saying, this is frightening, you know, and this, this, this is mm -hmm. bit after the um, verified campaign. But, you know, when you tell me, ask me about sources, it, it's really, really scary um, that potentially a, an algorithm could write news and how would people know the difference so we have to we have to keep them on board we have to keep evolving with these live blogs with these um with with, with the information across so many different platforms so that we can hopefully hit as many of them as possible but um i should say also that um you know with the twitter shake up the the, the x shake, the, the the platform formerly known as twitter x and elon musk's um you know the, the 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 question over the the anti-semitic posting and the the fact that advertisers are leaving in droves um it's really we we think that it's it's perhaps bringing more people into social media um produced by un news produced by other you know trusted sources like the guardian new york times uh we think people are coming not moving away from twitter necessarily but they're looking for more information from people like us which of course is great, um, but there's uh, added responsibility. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. I think that's a great last phrase for this first part, uh, introducing you as someone who is uh, producing information, but also using information. And so that's for us as information managers also. Very interesting to get that, that angle. Thanks a lot, Daniel. So now moving on to what I said was la série sur le gâteau, uh, and that's the academic angle. So it basically should cover what we've been hearing more in, in, in concrete details, how we deal as librarians, how we deal as communication professionals with, with information. And um, Professor Tommaso Venturini has done research in this area. So he's our next guest, our next speaker. He is a researcher at the Centre Society, an associate researcher for INRIA, that's the Institut National de Recherche en Sciences et Technologies du Numérique and the Media Lab of Sciences Po Paris. And he's the founding member of the Public Data Lab as well. I hope all of this is still correct. And he's here today because he's also associate professor at the Media Lab of the University of Geneva as well. So, um, Tommaso, if I may call you Tommaso, could you please tell us a little bit about your role at the Media Lab, the Media Lab in general, and, and the research that you focus on? Thank you very much, Sigmund. Thank you for having me here today. So, yeah, as you said, I've uh, joined the University of Geneva a couple of years ago. And since then, I've been working at the Media Lab. So I'm doing my research in this uh, little lab that we have at the University of Geneva, who's focused around um, online communication, both in terms of public debates, the kind of things that we have discussed so far, but also around the, um, the cultures of Internet, so the specific communities and like way of thinking and of talking and of discussing that takes place online. I also, I'm also the director of the master in communication and digital culture at the University of Geneva. So I'm also working on teaching this kind of things to the students of the University of Geneva. Okay, so what is the Media Lab doing uh, in that would concern information literacy? How does it touch on that part? So what we are doing and what I'm doing in particular within the, the Media Lab is to consider information maybe a little bit less uh, under the perspective of uh, true and false, if you want, and maybe more as a cultural phenomenon. Because <clears throat> particularly online information, um, what we call information, we, we can call information many different things. So, of course, the kind of news and sort of factual piece of content that one may need 
to act in a specific situation of crisis, for example. Uh, the example that we just given before um, is exactly one of these type of information. But of course, this is also <clears throat> online. It's indistinguishable from all other sorts of content that are there for entertaining us, that are there for keeping us connected to our friends uh, and our family and our sort of in the interest group we participate in. And so all of this, I believe and we believe at the Media Lab, um, it's, not, it's not easy and it's not possible and maybe it's not even useful to split into different categories. We really have to see online communication as this sort of, unfortunately, very messy um, continuum of different types of communication. Some of them can be and should be definitely um, evaluated under the perspective of are they true or are they false, can be fact-checked or not fact-checked. But many, uh, many of other of these pieces of, of information cannot really or should not really be understood according to this distinction because they are doing some different work. And even when we talk about misinformation online, I think it's very important that we uh, always keep in mind that if the type of misinformation that we have been discussing so far, um, that is like factual false information, but that is sort of pretend to be official information, is definitely a problem, but it's definitely not, unfortunately, not the only problem of uh, online communication. There are many other type of information troubles, as uh, scholars call them in uh, media studies, which have more to do uh, with the fact that people uh, do, not, do not have an healthy online debate, right? And even when we speak about um, how we should organize our collective life, how we should live together, uh, the political choices that we have to take as a society, um, this kind of debate um, is sometimes diverted, distorted, uh, distracted by many other types of information that kind of drives us away from this very serious discussion that we should have and take us to uh, more partisan uh, engagement, more uh, kind of clickbait kind of content or uh, satirical entertainment related content, but, but in a way that is not like, that is not clearly just entertainment that we can sort of push aside, but it's something that is a little bit of information, a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of information, a little bit of partisanship, a little bit of information, a little bit of uh, sh social networking with our peers and, and our families. And all this is, is very complicated. Um, but I th we think that it's really important that we look at this whole picture because otherwise, um, if we only focus on this information in a, in a strict sense, we can fix some problem of online communication or we can maybe not fix, but we can uh, mitigate some problems of online communication. But there are many, many others that actually remain. Mm -hmm. What did your research then say about disinformation when you look at, at this as a whole? Yeah, so one of the things that I try to push in the last few years is to replace um, the very common um, terms of fake news, which I don't like very much, and actually many uh, scholars in media studies don't like very much, precisely because this gives this idea that um, there's, such a thing as, there's such a thing as that true news, that, and that the mm -hmm. true news are easily distinguishable from, from the false news. Uh, which again, sometimes that's the case, but sometimes that's not the case because, you know, when one asks a malicious question or make a bad joke or um, suggest a conspiracy, but under like just, uh, just as a suggestion, right? With a question mark, for example. So that is not, it, it could not be uh, deemed as false as such. So for example, it's difficult to moderate for platforms, but it's still problematic. So I think that it, instead of speaking of fake news, uh, my suggestion is to speak of junk news, which is all these kind of contents that might be false or not false. That's not maybe the most important part, but they are junk in the sense that they are ad addictive, but they are not, they do not nourish the public debate. So they, they are of bad quality. And one um, indicators that I sort of suggested for detecting this information is information that can capture a lot of attention, a lot of collective attention, but only for a very limited span of time. Mm -hmm. So it is content that's extremely ephemeral, that maybe lasts 
uh, sometimes a few hours, sometimes less than that. So they, they, they turn everyone's head, they capture everyone's attention, but then they disappear as quickly as they sort of pop up in the public debate. And because they disappear so quickly, they do not allow for a more healthy, substantial, important uh, sort of debate and discussion to take place. Mm -hmm. Would you then also have something like um, uh, best practices for a healthy online debate? I think that the most important, um, I mean, if I were, if I were in charge, mm -hmm. I'm not, unfortunately, if I were in charge of um, recommendation algorithm of online platform, what I, what I would do is to definitely um, play down the way in which they are obsessed by trendiness. So um, the way in which most of this um, algorithm works is not even by pushing the contents that are the most popular is by pushing the, the contents that they are about to become popular mm -hmm. so that they are trendy, right? So they, they are very quick in picking up um, early signal of things that can become viral and bootstrapping them and making them even more viral. And I think that that is what creates this um, very, uh, at the same time, ephemeral, but also fragmented um, attention economy in which in which sort of different piece of news uh, pop up and then disappear very quickly. And then we, we move uh, very quickly to another subject and we don't take the time to, do, to discuss about the subject that just sort of that concerned us just a few hours ago. And so what, what I think would be very important is to slow down this discussion. Um, and this can be done in many different ways, but maybe the easiest way would be to tweak the algorithm so that they slow them, slow down a little bit. That they don't, that they, that they stick a little bit more to what they recommend, rather than keeping recommending new things so quickly mm -hmm. and so ephemerally. Do you have any examples already online from uh, any kind of platforms that go into this, uh, into this uh, area, that try to be different? Yeah, we have we have done a study on YouTube, for example. And we have seen that most of the videos on YouTube are only uh, watched for the, fr and we were studying like videos about news. So it can be slightly different for other types of video on YouTube, but um, the videos on information and news, they tend to die after one day, maybe not at most a couple of days. Um, so even if a video is a very high quality, I have a very good channel, it tends to be seen for maybe one day or two and then completely disappear. Mm -hmm. Like 99% of, of news videos on, on YouTube are dead after the first week uh, of their existence. Which, which means like in some cases, that's not a big problem, right? Because this is content that has been uh, produced to be consumed very quickly and then to be forgot about. Uh, but in some cases, it is a problem because precisely it sort of, it disencourage uh, producer, content producer for producing high quality content because they know that they, it, whatever they do, no matter how good is the content they produce, it will only last a couple of days. So they might as well uh, produce more content more quickly, which is what we observe, right? There's, there's a, um, and of course there are a lot of exceptions, which um, we don't have the time to discuss, but in general, there's a general acceleration of collective attention. So things are published even more quickly. And by the way, it's also true for academic papers, right? So we know that uh, people in the academia, like, like me, uh, are publishing more and more paper and more and more quickly. So I'm, and I'm, I'm not at all sure that the quality is improving uh, because of that. It's, you know, it might actually well be the opposite. That's very interesting. Thanks a lot, Soma. Um, there's, there's something I still want to know. Is there a way we can uh, decide for ourselves, for example, bit, I mean, fake and junk news, uh, so that we can get sorted a little bit. I mean, I th guess if we categorize for ourselves when we're looking for information, uh, then that might also help us to, to get through the, the amount of, of information that there is out there. Sure, of course. And actually, a lot of research, uh, I mean, the research on this kind of topic is kind of contradictory in a sense. Um, because on the one hand, we see that when people are asked to take the time to assess the information or the content that they read, they're actually quite good in general to distinguish content of sort of good quality and good factual precity 
from junk news and fake news. So that's not like most people are quite capable of fact checking. However, other research also shows that most people tend to um, reshare, so republish content without actually reading it. So maybe they just glance at the title, they think that the title is funny or interesting or whatever, or it can capture more attention from their own social network, and so they, they, share, they share it. Um, and so in many cases, this is the sort of the engine behind the resharing and the propagation of misinformation. It's not really people believing what they're sharing, it's just people sharing things, again, in a very ephemeral way without thinking too much about what they're doing. But if, again, exactly as I said for the, um, for the algorithm, the same thing is also true for the interfaces of online platforms, mm -hmm. which are precisely made so that um, the titles are very visible, the resharing button are very visible, the like, the, all, these type of, all these type of metrics are very, very highly present in this website, which encourage the user to precisely do this kind of ephemeral filtering of information rather than doing a, like a proper filtering of information, even though even if they would be capable. And so if we change, if we, we might, for example, ask the platform to change the platform in order to, as you said, uh, encourage people to be more reflexive about the information that they consume and possibly even more important, more reflexive about the information that they share. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to get back to the role of, of libraries or information professionals and, um, and what we can actually do with, uh, to help our users. First of all, ourselves, ourselves you know, to, to, to capture all this, to capture really what's pertinent. I think uh, that's, and, and that in a timely way, right? And then be able to transmit that and transfer some of these skills to, to our users. So um, what would you say then uh, that the future library could actually do, or that the, the, the library could already do right now to help researchers deal with that? What would be a good approach? Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good um, uh, question. And there's actually, there's many things, right, that you can do and many practical things that you're actually already doing and most of the lab are already doing, like, for example, training people in media literacy, training people in information literacy. This is all very important. But, but I actually would like to give maybe a slightly more general um, answer, which is that I think there is, um, I think that's the very ethos of the library, sort of the, the, um, ideals that are behind libraries as institution that we should cherish and that we should push more in the um, in our information society and that is actually the, the, the fact that i should say that is quite surprising because the web itself as you know of course you know uh, was born from the dream of librarians and archivists mm -hmm. the, the the world Wide web was supposed to be the library of the world uh, and he had been and it still is for some under some aspect uh, but then, because of uh, the um, basically because um, online platforms choose advertisement as their main business strategy, uh, this kind of ethos of libraries and archive and be kind of not forgot but pushed aside a little bit, marginalized a little bit, and we moved to another kind of uh, information management system, which is more about. Uh, we have to produce as much news, as much content as possible in as little time as possible so that we can also sort of intersperse it with more and more advertisement so that, you know, we can monetize this advertisement. Um, and that's, I mean, I'm not judging the platform. Of course, that's the that, that's business model, so that's what they should do. Uh, but I think we should also remember that that's not the only way we could treat information. And then there are other inf information institution such as library, such as archive, which have been there for thousands of years and have done a great job in preserving, choosing, selecting, slowing down all this process of consuming information. And I think we should, we should really cherish this function. Thank you, that's a really nice one. Uh, I think we, we're going to have this a citation now from this, from this event, you know, because it's a, it's a really nice word on, on libraries and the usefulness of libraries. Uh, the difficulty, of course, obviously being how do you get this, this message across, you know. So uh, with this, maybe I'm going to come back to the same question and want to ask Danielle, how could we get this kind of message across? And uh, what do you think the, 
library and, and, and archives and, and other information professionals can do to, to help with information literacy. Thank you, Sigrun. Um, yeah, I, I feel very warmly towards, um, towards libraries. I mean, your library in particular, it's just about 20 metres as the crow flies, and, and it's a place of sanctuary for me if I want to um, check out the latest uh, Monde Diplomatique or Le Canard Enchaîné. You know, it's great. It's just a wonderful place for me. You could have a coffee machine and some buns, I suppose, an ice bun, and that would be like, perfect but uh, or a snooker table too but then that's probably not a library anymore but no i wouldn't <laughs> want to change it too much um but um because it's it's a place where um you know it's a wonderful place to think and to to retreat when you just need to get your thoughts together uh because we are we are as i say we 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 are on this information highway and it is just i feel like we are uh, are really trapped on it sometimes. So it's good to step off, it's healthy to step off, and it's good to read different sources of information because it's like, it's like watching um, social media platforms. It's, to me, the information that we're getting every day, my, my inbox, probably like yours, is huge and it just fills up and fills up. Um, but when you watch a, a, a youngster following their social media stream, they are bombarded with information too. So libraries for me, I don't want to see them change that much. Thank you very much, if you don't mind. I'm, I quite like it the way it is. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm keen to um, make use of your, um, your partnerships with, with various publications. You know, that's really useful. Um, um, I would also maybe appreciate it uh, if you could continue to have more in-person events so that we can hear powerful testimonies from people and so I can talk to them but that's quite a selfish thing but you do that anyway um, and finally yeah I mean I wouldn't necessarily associate news deadlines with libraries um, nonetheless you know you're sort of the bedrock to, to what we are producing I know that I can get solid reliable information from you so um, it's it's a partnership that 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 can last and has lasted Will continue to last. That's it from me. Thank you and I think that comes back to what uh, Gervais was saying in the very beginning I mean and that's what is so excellent at the University of uh, Geneva is that there is this direct partnership w between the teaching staff and, and the library staff. Uh, I, I'm not sure this happens everywhere in Europe I think in, in America in general this might be this might be uh, greater but so um, Gervais can you uh, tell me what would you, with the, all your experience with this literacy program, is there something that, that you think we should be going forward to or that you would want to integrate into your literacy training? You were talking about, for example, AI, and I think that's going to be like, uh, it, it's, it's a major subject already, but it's probably going to be even, even larger and more important for us to understand as, as information professionals what, um, what the effects are of AI and how we can actually also use it, for example. So just, just as a thought, what would you want to integrate into your um, literacy program? Est-ce que vous m'avez bien entendu ou est-ce que je devrais peut-être répéter au français? Uh, oui, mais je vous ai entendu. Très bien. Um, oui, donc le, le, euh, notre souhait, ça serait d'avoir de, de, de couvrir plus de, de programmes, en fait, parce que tous les programmes ne sont pas couverts par euh, nos formations. Et, euh, et tout ce qui est information literacy n'est pas forcément enseigné par les, par les enseignants euh, à, à leurs étudiants. Donc, ça serait d'avoir une couverture un peu plus large. Et par rapport à l'IA, euh, je pense qu'on doit d'abord euh, nous former nous-mêmes à, à tous ces challenges euh, pour pouvoir ensuite euh, intervenir éventuellement dans, dans les cours. Ouais. Donc, la formation continue des, des, des bibliothécaires est, est aussi un... Uh, a challenge. Right. Merci. Donc, uh, so at this point, I would actually like to introduce another speaker. And uh, it's actually a colleague, Megan is a colleague from uh, the UN Library in New York, the Doc Hammarskjöld Library. Voilà. So Meg, uh, she works there as the head of scholarly publications. And she's also a Wikipedian, she told me with many, many years of experience. She was recommended by the head of the, the library in New York to be speaking at our event, so I'm really happy that she could make it, even though it's Thanksgiving Day over there. 
and we were all talking about the pies that she's unable to prepare right now, but hopefully later on. So, so thanks a lot, Megan, for being with us. So I just wanted to ask you, Megan, uh, how does the UN Library in New York, which is uh, also a bit closer to, which is at headquarters, right? Uh, how do you approach this subject of literacy? And I know that you have a couple of different angles, actually, that, that complement what we already said there. Yeah, thank you, Sigrun. Uh, it's such a wonderful question and really such a pleasure to be here today and to learn from each of our expert panelists. I've taken many, many notes um, and really appreciated the perspective that everyone brings. Um, so at the UN, we use the language of misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech uh, to describe these issues. And it's really an ever evolving area. Uh, with the start of the global pandemic, we saw an uptick at the Dog Hammers Cold Library um, based of queries based in inaccurate information. Um, so to address this, we began to provide a number of trainings and documentation. Um, and those outward facing trainings really served the role of advancing digital literacy via lateral reading as opposed to um, horizontal reading. Um, and verification. So Daniel spoke briefly about Project Verified initiated by USG Melissa Fleming in the Department of Global Communications. Um, in the Wikipedia community, we often say that we do not provide truth, but verifiability, right? Access to the citation so that the information user can go back to the original source and is empowered to evaluate that source. Um, and so the trainings provided by the Dog Harmer School Library also promote the library and its librarians, its information workers, as the in-house experts that they are in advancing information integrity, which is a strategic area of the organization. The world's more than, I guess, um, IFLA gives the number of 2.5 million libraries. Um, are very much committed to providing access to reliable information. And as information stewards, librarians have the expertise and the experience required to provide enhanced access to research now and in the future. Um, here at the United Nations um, and at the Dog Commerce School Library, we very much believe that access to information is a human right. And so that is core to the work that we do, both in advancing information integrity, but also in terms of advancing um, open science and the principles around open science. Could you tell us a bit more about open science and what this means for literacy? Because I never put these together as straight as yeah. you are doing it. Yeah, of course. Um, so inaccurate information <laughs> via all of these various platforms that we have on the internet is freely accessible to everyone. Uh, trusted and reliable information, so key scientific findings and the results of um, research produced through trusted channels um, is often only accessible to those that can pay. Um, so over 60% of climate change research um, articles published in the last decade are locked behind paywalls. And um, so how are we to address shared issues, um, particularly around the sustainable development goals, if we cannot share and access to this research? So the Doc Hammer School Library um, advances open science in support of the SDGs through convenings and other types of programming. Um, so we have our biannual UN Open Science Conference, webinars on key strategic issues and side events to the major um, convenings of the organization. Uh, as a librarian who has been working in open access for um, and open science for a little over a decade, um, these things became, you know, open science has always been absolutely critical to our work. Um, and that was particularly underscored within the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, these issues really entered the global stage. And so we know that um, access to research about the COVID-19 pandemic really accelerated the pace of scientific scientific advancements and ultimately the development of a vaccine. What is perhaps less discussed um, is how it related to um, a lot of the public health guidance that we received as well. So um, if we think back a few years ago, which feels like decades ago, um, we may, may remember that there were 
you know, a lot of disagreement on whether or not COVID-19 was airborne. Um, the medical literature distinguished between droplets and airborne transmissions. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, uh, so I cannot say much beyond that. Um, but it did draw the line between uh, droplets and aerosols at five microns. Um, this, the five microns, was really um, embedded within medical literature. Um, so much so that that source of it, that information often wasn't cited. It was just understood as fact. Um, and because it wasn't cited, it meant that it couldn't be verified. So some scientists felt that this um, provided an opportunity and really required further investigation. So they went back and started tracking citations, um, looking at earlier works in the medical literature, and they found a source citation and followed it all the way back to a book published in 1955, right? So we often think about research now, and this was published, you know, a great deal of time ago. Um, but that book, because it was the early days of the pandemic, wasn't available. The physical spaces of the libraries were closed, so the book couldn't be borrowed. An online rare bookseller had a copy, but it was prohibitively expensive. But with the help of a librarian, this researcher and her collaborators located a digitized copy of the book available through an online repository developed and maintained by libraries. And from that book, they were able to trace a thread within the scientific literature, identify the source of that five micron error, and with the larger scientific community, use that information to change the understanding of aerosol transmissions and associated public health guidance. So for instance, masking and being a certain distance away from each other, having certain air exchanges within a closed room. So, you know, right now within this information ecosystem, as information seekers are increasingly relying solely on the information that they find on the internet, I'm really thinking a lot about, and, you know, here at the Doc Commerce School of Library, we are thinking a lot about, you know, how can we as librarians make the wealth of our collections available to information seekers for free and on platforms that align with our shared professional values. Um, so for me, this is going to be a critical aspect um, of addressing these larger issues within the larger information ecosystem. Absolutely, thanks a lot, Meg. And, and obviously these are issues we grapple with every day and what a great impact story. Because we're always looking for impact stories when we're talking about library work, you know, when you do all this research and you do the reference with the researcher and, and then often you don't get the feedback here. And here we know we can actually trace it. So thanks so much, Megan. That was, uh, that was really uh, quite complimentary again to, to what we had been discussing before. So with that, I think we have a lot of time now for questions and answers. We have, I do not have the time right here, that's why. All right, sorry. Oh, cool, we got 15 minutes or 10 minutes. So um, uh, I will be receiving questions right here on the screen and I'm going to be reading off of that just a second okay all right so here we go i have a first question that uh, is for Gervais. do you reach all bachelor and master students in your training i think that was already answered in in the presentation and she wishes actually to have to reach more of them right but you might want to uh, to uh, repeat that or, or um, explain. Yes, uh, uh, yes, we, we reach a lot of bachelors, but not uh, not all for the for the moment. I think. Mm -hmm. And and I think what you were uh, talking about is is that there needs to be more of a coordination uh, on the on the planning side, probably with the teaching staff, and finding out about when the bachelors are doing their, their bachelor works, right? Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, we, we right. try to, to, co to um, plan that with the, um, the teachers, yes, and to, yeah. to reach uh, every bachelors, yes. Thank it's you. Uh, one of our uh, objectives, yeah. 
as a question for uh, Gervais and maybe those are students also are teaching staff, I would just encourage them to get in contact with the library at the University of Geneva and maybe we could put that on the chat actually, a, uh, if you have a generic address or something, that would be very interesting. Uh, then there is a comment from Anna to Daniel. It's very similar to the principles of reporting the climate crisis that will inspire hope to drive actions. State the facts, localize, humanize, and solutionize. Daniel. It's me. I can't. I cannot hear you, Daniel. Sorry. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. This is it now. Thank you. No, you can't yes, hear me? I can hear you. You can. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I should have written that down. It looked good. The, the, the point is, isn't it? You need to know who's saying it and should we believe them? You know, that's, that's the point. Why should we believe them? Um, if we can talk to them face to face, fantastic. Um, if the SG's saying it, it's normally okay for me. You know, that's okay. Uh, but uh, again, try and keep it simple. Why does it impact? How does it impact the most vulnerable people on the planet who we are here to help? That is the, the overriding principle that we use to report. Um, I don't know that I've properly answered how we verify sources but I think I've tried to intimate that more people are coming to us. We feel, certainly we've seen it with the metrics for social media. I mean, it's enormous with the, with the Middle East crisis. And a bit disappointing that compar comparatively speaking, um, climate warnings from people like the SG are not getting the same pickup. You know, it's a big step up. It's a, it's, it's a terrible shame. Nonetheless, there is hope that we can keep some of these new um, fans of, of UN News and the United Nations with us. Because we have to remember that outside this wonderful place where we have peacocks and, you know, also guards and gates that people no longer can visit, we still have people, and I meet them, who don't know what the United Nations is. Uh, and uh, we should remember that because uh, we should be talking to them more and more, not less and less. I'm certainly digress there, but anyway, thank you. No, but I think you, you put the focus again on the audience, right? And on the, on the ones that we are doing our work for. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, there, there are some general questions about literacy, actually. Uh, I might want to answer to one of them. One was, it just disappeared, but I think it was about the difference between uh, digital literacy, media literacy, and information literacy. And actually, there's there's actually, uh, mm, it's part of that. Information literacy is a very, very general concept. I summarized it in the very beginning under these three, with these three verbs, because I thought, okay, I yeah, just take, take the easy approach. It's to find, to analyze, and to use information. But then, of course, you also have literacies that you, if you want to, to um, uh, for example, produce particular programs on, then you might want to focus on digital literacy, and that might extend to whatever is also AI, for example. But it's, it's a very large field there. Media literacy is more about media and the news. That's how we, uh, the media that is being produced, right? But uh, overall information literacy sees it actually all together. We can also say there's a library literacy field, which is much more concrete than, you know, how do you transmit literacy in, in libraries? So uh, then there is another one about data literacy. Does it relate to information literacy? I would certainly think so. I don't know if Meg wants to talk about that one. I mean, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is, as with everything else, a growing and developing area. Um, when it comes to data literacy, I really, I start thinking about, um, you know, not upon uh, reproducibility of the studies and, you know, fair principles for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, all of which are absolutely critical um, to data literacy. But I start thinking about the citizen who is reading a newspaper report, right, on the most recent finding. 
And do they have access to the original study, right? Mm -hmm. Where they can evaluate the results of the data. Do they understand the implications of sample size and the analysis of that data? Do they then have access to the data and itself, right? And so um, there, I think there's a real role for librarians to work with scientists and other researchers to make sure that they are creating code books so that others can understand um, how the data was collected um, so that users can engage with it more effectively and responsibly. Um, I also really appreciate what um, I believe Daniel was saying earlier about data is not everything. Um, you know, there's a lot of incredibly important work right now being done around um, gender, right? So gender within the scholarly literature and who is publishing in what areas, um, how are individuals cited? Um, and it often looks to men and to women, right? Um, and as a transgender non-binary individual, I fall into neither of those categories, right? Um, and so when we start to sort of reduce our understandings of the lived world into data points, right? There's going to be a certain slippage. There's going to be a certain loss of the representation of truth. So having an opportunity to provide access to as much information about how that data is collected and for what purposes is really going to allow us to engage with it more effectively. Um, and so I look forward to continuing conversations around that area because I, um, I don't wanna say it's underexplored, but I do wanna say there is a great deal more to know. Thank you, Meg. And it's so true. I mean, also as librarians, we've only been speaking in the last two years, I think, about our expertise in data management, right? For example, so there are many ways actually to explore uh, for our profession there as well. And so I think I have the final question now that I'm up there, and this one is for Tommaso. Is there a role for chunk news in understanding our world today? I think it's a great question, actually. And what's your opinion from a cultural perspective? Should I? Re was I not fast no. enough? Yeah, it, it is a good oh, question. Oh, sorry, I cannot um, hear you. I think that um, Here we go. maybe Thanks. not so much for junk news, because junk news, I, at least the way I define them, are really just um, piece of contents that do not contribute to uh, the way we, about we think about our society and our collective life. However, um, there are actually studies that have shown that some piece of information that was factually false have spurred interesting discussion, have eventually created an interesting debate that that brought um, internet in, that that pushed people to reflect about uh, the questions that was raised by this fake information. So to some extent, if fake information is spotted and if it becomes a moment to talk about it, uh, sort of um, see what's behind it, how it has been created, why it has become so popular, so it becomes again a moment for healthy public debate then it can actually it can actually be turned inside out and contribute to our collective discussions great that's that's absolutely true right i guess that's how we have to approach it in any case we have to be positive about it we're we ourselves are creating all this right and we're participating in it so so there there's also a way to manage that and to use it in a positive sense. thank you um daniel i think you had your hand up before i didn't see that one did you still want to re respond Thank you, Sigrun. It was just um, to to add to what Meg was saying that um, on on the data front, I'd be really keen to have more um, avenues to pursue data verification because you know if you look at say the New York Times and they produce their data reports on where missiles are going from and to um, you know and then you you look at how many people have been involved in those reports. It's it's sometimes 10 people on one report, whereas that's more than we have in one language team, way more, you know, sometimes three times more. So if you want to, to get quality data, you're going to have to invest. And of course, that's not something we at the UN are able to do, but it's a real shame because we could do so much more. Mm. Absolutely, thank you. So uh, I think we're coming to the end of this conversation. So I have to turn around just to look at the yeah 
we're almost there yet. So uh, at first I was thinking I'm going to just repeat all the key points that I gathered here, because there are quite a lot of them. Some of them are also citable. So we'll definitely get back to you, possibly with some of the phrases that we might want to use then on, on some of our accounts. Uh, but what we will do is we'll have a follow-up uh, email probably to all those who registered with the key points in it. So we're not going to just repeat things like that. But let me tell you, because in the very beginning I explained to you that um, this is actually a launch, a launch event for this whole series of, of products that we're planning on doing for information literacy. We will have videos, podcasts, and anything else that could help us dive deeper into the particular aspects. One of the, the things that was mentioned as a good practice also was diversifying, right? Also in formats, to be able to reach uh, different types of, of people with different types of learning um, needs, for example, as well. Uh, so this is definitely what we're going to try and do. So I hope that uh, you stay connected. I want to invite you just to join us on YouTube, or on YouTube, or on Facebook, or, or X as well. Uh, and please stay tuned because there'll be more products like that. So with all that, I'd just like to very, very much thank all of our speakers. I think it was an extremely interesting and really exciting discussion. I had promised an exciting one, and I think we definitely had that. I myself also learned a whole lot. Uh, our institution is definitely going to give time to things. Thank you so much. It's going to stay with the ethos of a, of a library but we're evolving with the technology as, as all of us are doing. And I think uh, another th really good lesson to be learned is the networking, the exchange uh, between professionals. You know, here we are uh, actually from different fields, but still we all work on information and we have different angles. And I think that's really crucial to be sharing uh, continuously as things are evolving so quickly. So thank you all, uh, you great speakers. And also to all our participants, I'm very glad that you that you were uh, joining us. I hope that you stay tuned, like I said. And now with all that, I just wish you a nice afternoon here in under CET and all the others, happy, happy Thanksgiving and or a nice evening to the others around the world. Thanks a lot. See you soon at the comments again. Thank you, Sigrun. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.